Excited to welcome Norfolk State head coach Robert Jones to the podcast. This past season, Coach Jones led the program to only its second ever MIAC title and an NCAA tournament first four win. The 2019 MIAC Coach of the Year, Jones has led NSU to a 72% win percentage in MIAC play, fifth in the nation among coaches with at least 100 games coached and made six postseason appearances in seven years of postseason play. A former assistant coach at Norfolk State, only once in Jones' 14 seasons as either an assistant or head coach as NSU finished outside the top four in the regular season standings. In fact, Norfolk State is currently fifth in the nation in Division One basketball for the longest streak of 500 or better conference records, now at 23 years and counting, heading into the 2021-22 campaign. Coach Jones, welcome to the podcast. Hey, hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate you. Well, we're excited to talk and, uh, you know, you've had great success. I read it in the bio just before, obviously, about your particularly your MEAC regular season success there. But uh, something extra clicked last year, didn't it? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, we finally got over the hump and got to the NCAA tournament. I mean, it was like the, uh, for me, I guess, in my career, you know, well, career so far, hope, uh, you know, hopefully my career is not over, right? It's not, <laughs> coach. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, just a, like a final um, check for me because, um, you know, I had got to the CIT. I had won regular season championships. I got to the NIT. I had a big win in the NIT. But the NCAA tournament was elusive. I got to the championship game two times before that. So it was just finally like kind of getting over the hump. Um, and, uh, you know, it was just a great experience. No doubt. It was fun to watch. And uh, first, especially that uh, first four game was, or was, was tremendous to watch as well. But coach, what, what were some of the things that uh, helped this team get over that hump? Was it more technical tactical? Was it player driven or was it something more psychological? I think a little bit of everything. Um, I think that yes, last year we had a lot of guys who returned from the team that, you know, was part of the COVID stricken season. So like the year before, we were actually probably playing some of the best basketball of anybody in the conference. I think even like Ken Palm had us rated the best team in the conference going to the MEAC tournament, but we never played a game in the MEAC tournament due to the tournament, you know, being um, taken away due to COVID. So that kind of, you know, stuck with the guys for all year, you know, um, all summer. And, and then, you know, once the season finally got approval to happen again last year, um, I think these guys just kind of wanted a little revenge, you know, because they felt like they could have won it the year before, honestly. So, um, you know, we, we got it and we played well and then we were able to play some some non-conference opponents um, that normally probably wouldn't play us, especially in the state of Virginia. And also the way our schedule was 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 tailored. Um, we didn't have a whole bunch of guarantee games. We had a few, uh, which we were able to, to win a, a couple. Um, we had George Mason was a guarantee game. James Madison was a guarantee game and we won those games. But it kept us at a good, um, I think it's just a good mental a pace, you know, a place, I should say, like, you know, we were able to win a lot of games early, uh, which built the confidence, you know, not going through some of the rough patches you go through on year to year playing, you know, all these guaranteed games all across the country and things like that. So it just kind of just kept a good, kept us in a good place for the whole season. Um, I think we never went under 500 overall for the season. So we, you know, we just was in a good, a good place mentally. And then um, just from a tactical standpoint, uh, for me as a coach, it just really challenged me because, um, you know, we didn't have a summer. Um, like I'm going to have summer workouts in a few, um, but we didn't have summer last year at all. So just kind of really um, streamlining things from the from September on to really, you know, make some things happen for us. Well, you mentioned guarantee games and uh, let's get into that because our, our listeners aren't just American, they're throughout the world. Okay. And uh, I think coaches don't appreciate when you look at a mid-major or a low-major coaches record the conference record is really the one that reflects your quality and your success more than anything because of these guarantee games. And can you just explain that to those that may not know what you're talking about? Well, a guarantee game in, in theory is supposed to be a, a, a guarantee win for the other team and a guarantee check for the team that they're playing. Um, you know, so, and usually those, those games are supposed to be lopsided games and, and things of that nature. So, you know, you might get like a, you know, a Syracuse who wants to play us, or something like that. And they'll give us, you know, $90,000 to play. So, you know, they think they, they can beat us. And then, so, you know, they get the win on their record, but we get the $90,000. And I guess everyone's supposed to walk away happy, <laughs> you know, after that. Uh, like I said, we've been fortunate enough to win some, you know, a lot of guarantee games, honestly. Um, so our guarantee games are a little harder to come by these days, but, uh, you know, that's in theory what it's supposed to be. But also, like you said, it kind of skews the records of coaches um, because now you don't, you don't realize how quality of a coach, you know, it, it is because you might 
some teams have to play more guarantee games than others. You know, we're fortunate here at Norfolk State that we don't have to play that many. We might play five, you know, per year, maybe, um, maybe six sometimes. But there's other teams that play 10, 11, 12 guarantee games. So, like, you have teams that might start off 0 and 12, but it doesn't really mean they're a bad team. They're just playing all these guarantee games. And then even for myself, you know, even having a, a pretty solid overall record uh, with 23 games, you know, above 500, you know, if I could take away maybe those 50, 60 guarantee games, you know, then, you know, my record could be even that much better. So, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a give and a take. And a, sometimes you have to sift through it to really understand um, what's really going on at some of these mid to, to lower uh, institutions and these coaches' records and things like that to really get the true merit of a coach. Well, I'm glad we went through that because I mean, I'm many colleagues at your levels and, uh, you know, all, and, and you're not lying when you say they have to play 10 plus guarantee games and they have to make a certain number for their budget every year. And that's why they have to do it. And, uh, you know, the pressure of that and also the psychology for your players, because again, like they were often on the road. The one coach I'm thinking of was often on the road for weeks at a time to get all these guarantee games in as well, which is another psychological part of that, that affects academics, life, everything else that goes with it. Doesn't it? Yeah. Without question. I mean, you know, you could easily be on the road for three weeks, four weeks, because, some of those guarantee games, if you have to play that many, you know, come so fast and furious that it makes no sense to come back home. So you're just going from, you know, playing two days in between, playing another game, different city, probably different time zone, different coast. Sometimes it's just playing, you know, these games, because like you said, you know, a lot of teams do have to subsidize their budget with a tremendous amount of um, guarantee games. So, um, you know, it's tough. And then if you lose, you know, you lose one real bad, it's kind of hard to bounce back right away for these kids, you know, so you hope, even us, you know, when we choose guarantee games, the ones that we're able to, you know, actually get somebody to agree upon is that, like, we'll try to choose ones that, one that we think that we either can win, you know, or it's going to be a pretty good fight, you know, so, like, you don't crush the kids' um, spirit. So, you know, it's, uh, you got to be a little strategic when you're picking these guarantee games. Well, you mentioned your overall record and certainly your conference record, and uh, you found a way to compete. And that's what we want to talk about because some of these, some of these lower levels too, you have to find some things that help you compete against all levels of teams. Right. And uh, the one thing that you've talked about, and uh, I know you've shared a lot with people is this floppy defense. So first let's talk about competing with an imperfect roster and then we'll get into this floppy defense. Well, for us, like, you know, like you said, you know, we had to figure out a way to, um, because I'm egotistically, I'm, I, I like winning, you know, I, I hate losing. So <laughs> we all gotta, do. Yeah, yeah. So you gotta, you gotta figure out a way to, to win, you know? So uh, sometimes when we play some of those guarantee games, I mean, we're playing against some pros and things like that. And um, I think that I have pretty good players, but you know, year to year, I don't have a lot of pros, you know, um, you know, I have overseas pros, but I don't have NBA pros. So, it's, you know, it's a different level so for us to be able to compete and win some of these games um we had to come up with different schemes and things like that to make it a little bit more difficult for those teams that we're playing against you know to to come and just do whatever they wanted to do so um probably my, my right before my first year started myself and my assistant coach at the time larry vickers who's now the, the, the head women's basketball coach here at norfolk state um we we came up with um a system called a floppy system because i mean actually he kind of sparked the interest and then I kind of just ran with it a little bit um, and kind of, you know, tweaked it in this though. Cause he said, um, is there any way, you know, you think that um, we can play zone and change the man mid possession. And I'm like, I don't know, maybe, you know, and then, so he sparked the idea and then, um, you know, I kind of, you know, ran with it and then figured out a way to do it. And then we, we've been figuring out that way. And then, I mean, it's been really confusing teams um, because we also play like a matchup zone too. So between our regular man to man, which is which is primarily under the floppy gets a lot of attention, but we we primarily a man to man team, like probably 65, 70% we play man to man. But with that being said, with us playing the man to man, us playing a, a, um, a matchup three, two zone, and then us doing the floppy stuff really confuses um, teams. And, and I know even, you know, we play Appalachia State and I know, uh, Avery Johnson, it's funny that he called my game because, you know, we had beat him in the NIT. And, uh, you know, and, you know, I know he kept saying that I, when I watched the game over that, you know, Norfolk State has a million defenses. They're going to have a million defenses and things like that. And it's really not a million. It just looks like that to people. <laughs> you know, like the kids know what's going on, you know, but it's just, it just looks like it's like, you know, oh, they're in a different defense again. Next, you know, and it's really kind of like the, the same, but maybe just a little tweet and stuff like that. So um, that's how the floppy kind of came up with. And um, like I said, it was myself and Larry Vickers right before my first year, um, just trying to figure out a way to throw some of these, these bigger teams off 
off guard to, to be able to win basketball games. Uh, it's great stuff. And we're going to get into some of the specifics about your man and then also the floppy defense. And uh, you, you beat Alabama uh, when Avery Johnson was there in the NIT, correct? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Great. And uh, so you're trying to create confusion and chaos by switching your defense in the middle of possessions. And that has become popular. So the first question becomes, how do you communicate this? How are you communicating the different changes within the possession to your players? Uh, it's just, I mean, it's just drilled, you know, over and over. And I, really, we have like just one trigger, like a, a trigger, you know, and, and we just drill that trigger over and over. So, you know, if it goes to whatever side we, we, we put the trigger on, then it just triggers whether we change to man to man or whether we change to our three, two zone mid possession. So, um, you know, that's just, it's just drilled to the guys over and over. And then sometimes we'll, uh, you know, we'll look at film and, and see a team that, okay, maybe they like to go to the right side a lot to start their offense. And, and maybe we won't trigger on the right side. Maybe we'll trigger on the left, you know, maybe we, you know, you know, we'll just kind of really toy with them a little bit, you know, and, 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 you know, you can see, it's always a delight when you look at the other sideline and you see the coaches in frustration, you know, it's like, you know, it's, even the Appalachia state game, um, you know, the first half when we were playing zone and kind of a matchup two, three, and then we played the three, two, a little bit, you know, you can look down at, at coach Kearns, which is a, you know, excellent coach and you can see his frustration, you know, and it was like, you know, you kind of smile a little bit, <laughs> you know, at it. And, but um, it's just, you know, over and over, you just try to just drill the guys about, you know, what we're going to do. And then when it comes to man to man, I mean, we play like a modified pack line, man to man. Um, so, and, and really I was a guy that, that was like an old school guy in a sense that, um, you know, one pass away, deny, two passes away and help, you know, kind of like, you know, full denial, denial. But honestly, we played Virginia uh, my second season, I think it was. Um, we played them two years. We played my first season and second season. After the second season, we never played them again. But it was the first season, the second season. First season that we played, we only we might have lost by maybe, I don't know, 10 points maybe. So it was, you know, it was close. My second season, which I think was Tony Bennett's maybe fourth or fifth season. So now his system was fully in place, you know, it just felt like we couldn't move out there. You know, like, I mean, we had some good players and we won a lot of games that year, but against them, it felt like we couldn't get a shot off. Like we couldn't move. So I really, after that game, I really kind of started to study the pack line um, defense. And, um, you know, once again, maybe shout out to Tony Bennett. He helped me. I mean, he, he you know, playing against them helped me change my whole defensive philosophy. I still do a couple of things different because I still like a little more pressure on the ball than maybe he does, but Everything else is probably, you know, the, the same. And, and, it, and it comes from from that game, you know. And then we've been fortunate enough the last four or five years to be top 25 this year, top 50, you know, last couple of years with, with field goal percentage defense in the country. So, um, you know, I guess I guess it's working for what we need to do. Well, a lot to unpack there. Let's start, start first with uh, – I'll come back to the triggers because I want to ask you a little bit more about that. But let's start first with uh, – what do you start with? You tar start with your man-to-man -man defense, I'm assuming, in terms of when you teach this? Yeah, without question. I think man-to-man, -man, um, you know, has principles. Um, you know, if your man-to-man -man principles are solid, you know, you can incorporate those principles in, into zone principles and you can incorporate into, you know, floppy principles and things like that. So, um, Are you forcing the same direction in both defenses or all three defenses? Pretty much, yeah. For we we force middle, which like the pack line tries to do. So um, you know we don't force baseline. So we try to always say like the help is in the middle, which you know, so just kind of based on pack line principles. And I guess what I'm getting at is for many of these coaches like you that are switching defenses within possession, well, it's not as complicated as you think because a lot of the principles stay the same from each defense, right? So your on the ball defense is essentially the same. Correct, correct. So it's, it's yeah, and, and what you said is like a lot of times people ask, you know. Um, how do you do that? You know, how, you know, you know, that got to be hard to do. And honestly, it's, it's really not that hard to do if you, you know, really just, you know, just kind of drill it, you know, and 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 have a trigger, you know, and and everyone just kind of knows what you're in. And of course, it's a lot of communication. So if you're, if you're a team that doesn't communicate or doesn't, you know, don't, doesn't like to talk on defense, then it's never going to work because, you know, you have to say, hey, the ball went to your side. Okay, we're in three, three, you know, or whatever it is, or man to man or whatever it is. If, if, no one is talking and to get everybody on the same page, it's not going to work. So obviously any defense in the absence of effort and communication is not going to work. So that's true. So you mentioned the triggers again. So let's get to that then. It's it's similar to what we would call an automatic on offense. If it, if this happens, then we're automatically in this. And that's sure. what you're talking about in terms of the trigger. And often in these changes in the middle of possession, some triggers are like a ball reversal, 
a um, ball screen, a high post flash, different triggers like that could trigger you to go to a different defense. In your case, what are the triggers? Is it the position of the ball, position of players? What are the triggers? No, I mean, for us, uh, and, you know, I, I know your, your podcast is very popular, so not to, not to give up all the secrets, but... <laughs> not to give away the specifics, Coach. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. I mean, for us, um, you know, I mean, the main trigger for us, and like I so said, without giving away the specifics of everything that goes on, is that um, we start off in a, a 2-3 zone, usually, for uh, the floppy. So, usually, if whatever side the guard is on, we'll trigger it from that side. Now, that either, you know, will either trigger either a man-to-man possession either trigger a, a three, two possession, depending on what we call, you know, from the sidelines, but that's the main trigger to see whatever we we're going to be in is that, you know, the, the trigger is going to be the, um, the, the, whatever side the guard is on, you know, so a pass to that side. So sometimes we'll try to deter that pass early to let people, you know, think that we're just, we're in regular two, three. And sometimes we are in regular two, three, that's the other beauty of it too. So sometimes we are in two, three, but um, we just try to, you know, sometimes deter that pass, and then, so now when we finally go to our trigger, whether it's like I said, it's man or three, two or whatever we're doing, that now is a, a lower shot clock and you're kind of already in your, your zone offense. So if we do switch to man, you're still running your zone cuts and usually it's not going to be working. So it usually ends up in a ball screen, which we trap the ball screen after that. And, you know, that's it was usually when the magic happens. Well, it's great. And, and you're making all the synergy people who tag games, uh, making their jobs really hard because uh, when you look at those percentages, I'm imagining they're not even correct in terms of the number of zone possessions and man possessions. Not so I'm curious, um, do you have a general idea of Len, what percentage of possessions you stay within one defense versus what percentage you change to uh, the multiple defenses? Uh, I guess it's probably about 70, 30, 65, 35, something like that. Um, I forgot exactly what the number was, but um, we're primarily a man-to-man team. You know, we like, you know, I like man-to-man, um, you know, but but I will say, though, that sometimes we'll try to, like, you know, we'll mess around at the beginning of the second half with, you know, our floppy or our just zone or whatever. And although I'm a man-to-man guy, like, we'll, we have stayed in, in zone the whole half because – if, if I see that as, you know, messing with someone, you know, the other, the other team, I'll stay with it. You know, I'm, I'm a guy, too, that, you know, um, well, I, well, let me rephrase that. I've changed my thoughts on some things. Before, I was, you know, you kind of brainwash that if a team has shooters, don't play zone, you know, and if a, a team, you know, if, you know they, if they can't shoot, play zone and things like that. Um, you know, I was reading some stuff with Jim Behind and, and he's something that he said that kind of like changed my whole mentality with it. I know obviously he's like the zone king, you know, for the NCAA, but he said that um, a team, you know, they tell you if a team shoot 40 percent, don't play two, three or, or whatever zone you're going to play against them. Play man. But he said that normally teams play man. So they're, they're clearly shooting 40 percent against man. So why, you know, why would you change that? And then the other thing that I've come to find out with is two other things is that one People's zone packages are way smaller than the man-to-man packages. So some people have 80, 90 man-to-man plays, wrinkles, and all types of stuff like that, but then they have like five zone plays. And I think within the course of a game, we can figure out the five zone play or course of a a stretch that we can figure out what five zone plays they're going to run or if they're going to run something over and over, we can pick it up. Um, And then the other thing I've come to find out is that uh, a lot of times, even if you have shooters shooting 40%, um, Usually your, your man-to-man plays, you know, you're running staggers, you're running misdirection, which is getting these guys open. You know, sometimes people don't have good zone plays to get the shooters open. They're just hoping to, to swing, swing, and get the shooter open. So um, those are kind of like the three things that I've kind of, you know, saw that uh, changed my, my, my mentality to, towards playing more um, zone or, or, or switching up defenses a little bit more. I love that. That's great insight into, uh, you know, why it would still work, even though you might think based on numbers, it might not. And the other part that I know from having played against matchup zones and stuff like that, the, the first thing as an opponent is to get your players to not overthink it, to just run offense. Right. And that's what you often see is they're trying to figure out, they're trying to spend too much time trying to figure out if it's man or zone rather than just play and run offense. Right. Yeah. Without question. I mean, and, I keep using people as examples, but I think, you know, coaches, uh, especially young, younger coaches like myself, and, and, and you use examples of other people to try to, like, make your own kind of, you know, system. Um, and I try to use successful people, honestly. So, uh, you know, I, I looked at one time Shaka Smart, when he's, at, when he's at VCU, he said that, you know, they used to press so much, you know, the havoc and stuff like that, that teams spend so much time, you know, preparing for havoc, you know, preparing to break their press, that they forget to work on their office execution. They forget to worry about, worry about their defense. They just worry about breaking – 
you know, havoc so much that they got six different press breaks they didn't put in in one week and, you know, everything like that. So a lot of times with us, because we, you know, mix up our defenses so much, people are spending so much time trying to figure out how to crack our defense, how to, you know, how to do this, if this happens and trying to, you know, watch film to figure it out. And you still, you know, it's still kind of hard to figure out that now it takes away from their preparation, just their own team preparation. So, um, you know, changing defenses have been pretty, pretty good for us, you know, and, and disguising defenses have been pretty good for us as far as, you know, um, dealing with other teams. That's gold coach. I'm glad you shared that example. That's uh, such a tremendous example of maybe us not thinking about what the real impact is, is that they're not doing what they do best against yeah. you. And they're not practicing that going into the week or thinking about that. So that's great. So floppy defense, essentially just to give an overview for coaches is. Floppy defense is changing from zone to, to man mid possession or zone to for us zone to a matchup zone um mid possession um and like i said it, it works best for us when we press back into the floppy because now you know hopefully you have a good enough pressure that you can take off six seven eight seconds you know in the backcourt now of course the point guard has to call a play he's probably gonna call a play against two three um not knowing if we're gonna stay in two three we're gonna play man we're gonna play three two and by the time they figure it out you know that we're doing something different then the shot clock is now down to 10 which is our red zone and usually when it's down to 10, I mean, usually either a bad shot or a ball screen is going to happen just to try to make to make something happen. And then we're able to just um, counteract that with, uh, you know, like I said, usually, usually trapping the ball screen. So you talked about pressing. So let's go there. Uh, so the ideal for you is to press first. Is yeah. it an aggressive press or is it more of a passive press where we're trying to take clock and uh, slow their progress off progress the floor? Usually clock. I mean, we yeah. do have an aggressive press that we do some run and jump stuff, but especially we in floppy, it's all about the clock for us because we know that we're going to like, we, we should be able to turn them over almost or get them to take a bad shot in the half court and not worry about getting a turnover in the full court. So we just keep them in front, you know, use our rotations the right way and then get them in the half court and then do, you know, what we do to them in the half court, whether it's floppy or, you know, whatever else we do. So a lot of times it's about just slowing them down, letting that clock run a little bit, let them think, not give up any quick strikes, you know, uh, up the floor, just really kind of packing it in on the press to really uh, get them in the half court. Cause we don't like, we don't mind playing in the half court. If you look at us play, you know, and I know synergy doesn't have like this, that, but we actually get a lot of shot clock violations, honestly. And um, it's amazing because we get shot clock violations. Against, I mean, all, all walks of teams, you know, from your high majors are supposed to have all these pros and things like that. And all these great coaches to, you know, your low majors. And, and sometimes, you know, of course, non-division ones that we might play in the exhibitions and stuff like that. So it's a whole, whole gamut of, of teams that we get shot clock violations. Sometimes, honestly, we're on the bench and we can't, be, like one time we got seven shot clock violations in a game against a division one team. And we were kind of like, we, we didn't believe it was happening, you know, but we, we were playing at a really, really high level defensively and we really had the other team confused. So um, it, it was a good, a good day. Simply. When using the full court pressure, uh, do, do you have a preference of what you go back into or is it variable as well? Variable. I mean, um, we try to make all our stuff connect. So even though, like I said, it looks like we're doing a whole bunch of different things. It's all connected one way or the other. Um, you know, our primary zones are, are, are three, two and two, three. You know, every now and then we'll throw in a one, three, one. If we, you know, just for change of pace midseason, maybe or beginning of the season, you know, things like that. But our primary zones are two, three and three, two. So everything is going to go back to either two, three, three, two or man to man. And the rotations we practice is, is pretty simple. Um, so whether we're doing a two-two-one, a one-two-two press, um, those are our primary presses. We don't, I don't really do like diamond and things like that. Um, and, and you know, if we're doing a run and jump press, then you know we'll probably probably be in man-to-man -man after that. So everything is like based on two-three, three-two, and man-to-man, -man, and then we just kind of just throw fluff <laughs> around it, which you know we use from different game to game. This is great. This is fun to talk about. And uh, you talked about them being connected. So essentially when we're thinking about this, then there's a call in the full court, there's a call in the half court, and then there could be a call mid possession. Can there be more than one call within a possession in the half court? Are you going to switch to say three defenses or usually just to one defense? No, usually just the one to make it simple, um, to make it simple and, and, and solid, you know, for us. So it wasn't, you know, it doesn't cause too much chaos. It's like, you know, you kind of already know, like, if we're in a pressure, like, if we say, you know, at the free throw line, we're in red three or something like that, then we're using a pressure back to three, two, you know, like, you know, red, red, red two, you know, stuff like that is two, three. Um, and then we'll have other calls, you know, for like our two, two, one press and things like that. But it's all going to end like in probably two, three or five, usually. Um, so, um, you know, 
And a lot of times, the, you know, the other team, as, as, as much as they're supposed to be paying attention, they're not really even paying attention to what, you, what, you, what you're saying, to be honest with you. Uh, so you're able just to kind of just speak freely and just, you know, your guys understand what you're talking about and just they get back right to, you know, what, they, what they're supposed to do. That's great. And uh, I know we're talking about technical tactical and we're going to keep going on that. But the other part of this is obviously the psychology for your players and yeah. the self-efficacy that this builds, that they have this belief that this system can help balance the power, so to speak, within that. I'm imagining that's something you sell to them as well through the process. Yeah, without question. I mean, I think a lot of times the guys we recruit um, because we do have a winning culture. Um, I think people almost believe as soon as they come into the door honestly, you know, because they, you know, they come in here and we can show them different stats of our success. You know, it's not like we're selling them a dream, like, you know, hey, we're going to be the top 50 team in the country defensively. No, we have been a couple of times. So just listen to what we have to say. And usually it's like, uh, you know, it's an easy sell, honestly, at this point. And then also as the year goes on, even like some of the newer guys that maybe might be a little, you know, have a little apprehension at first about what's going on. I mean, they're going to do what you ask them to do, but they, you know, I know how it is, you know, they have a little apprehension when they start to see some of those shot clock violations, they start to see people like not knowing what's going on, um, you know, and they're calling like man plays when we're in zone or calling zone plays when we're in man, you know, they start to kind of get uh, that little mojo going that, um, oh, hey, this really, really works. So we're like buying more and more into it. And then sometimes even in the huddle, you know, they'll come and say, hey coach, you know, can we go floppy this, you know, against them because they don't, you know, know what's going on. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, it's like, it's like an overall belief in the, in the system, which is, which is fun after a while when the, when the guys really get into it. Well, especially when they start to empower themselves to be able to say, Hey, this is a great time to do this. Then you yeah. know you got them. Don't you coach that they really don't just buy in, but they also understand. Yeah. 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 Without question. They, they also understand and they understand what's going on. And they, um, you know, they said they believe, I think the first part about, you know, um, anything is that, you, you know, you have to believe it and then, you know, you have to execute it, you know, after that, you know, so, um, you know, they, they believe it and they execute it. Getting into some more specifics then, are, is there any switching incorporated? I know you mentioned matchup zone and that essentially, if you do it right, seems like a switching defense. Are you doing any other type of switching to throw off the defense in terms of ball screen, et cetera? Uh, sometimes we switch, um, depending on the person that we have on the floor. You know, um, I know the new the new wave in basketball is all this switching and I'm, you know, you know, I'm not totally sold on that completely. Um, but I think in certain instances, especially when you really want to throw off a team uh, offensively, that's used to like a rhythm team that, you know, they want to throw the ball here and throw the ball there. And, you know, they, you know, once you get, get a lift up on the pick and roll and things like that, is that uh, we will switch and we will switch sometimes one through five, depending on the personnel that we have out there. That's great. And uh, then into some of these specific actions that you have to defend. Uh, well, let's start with this. Let's start with what do you find coaches do most often when they come into a game against you guys? Uh, are they running mainly man and then sometimes go to zone sets or are they trying to figure out exactly what you're doing? I guess when we try to, when we do our floppy against that, you're talking just about just in general, like they come into a game, they know you're going to change defenses mid possession. Do you find that they are just staying true to one and just running man the whole game against you? Or are they trying to figure out what you're actually doing each possession? John, they're trying to figure out which, which usually leads to our favor of the shot clock running out. Yeah, of um, course. Yeah. So like they're trying to figure it out. Um, because, I mean, normally we're, we're, we're probably easy to figure out the first couple of possessions, but we're, we're going to be a man to man. I mean, you, you know, it's probably no secret that we're going to be a man to man. Now, after the first couple of possessions, you know, who knows what we're going to be in. But usually the first couple, we're going to be in man to man. You know, I just want to see what I want to see what, what it looks like, you know, what, what the other team has. And I want to see, you know, usually I think that energy comes from man to man. And, you know, if you can start off right away. Um, and then I think it, it helps breed energy when we do go zone or floppy and things like that. So um, usually we do start in man to man. Um, no, no matter what, uh, you know, to start the game with, unless we're really, you know, depleted, you know, and we have to try to save some guys and we go zone, but that's on very, very rare um, occasions. So, um, you know, I think that a lot of guys, a lot of other teams are just trying to just figure out most of the time what we're in. And then we can could, we could, we could mess with them a little bit when it comes to that. And you mentioned ball screen defense. You mentioned before trapping ball screens. Um, yeah. Is that, uh, is that something you'll do out of all three defenses is just keep it consistent and trap ball screen? No, well, we don't trap ball screens too much on on zone. Um, okay. We try to do, uh, um, you know, we'll, you know, obviously we'll pass it through on some some ball screens, and then we'll also try to uh, try to, you know, I know some people say ice, or, you know, we we call it blue. Some people say down, you know, the ball screen, keep it on one side um, against a two three zone. So because a, a lot of times people want to try to overload the, the, the two three with the with the ball with the ball screen, the reverse reversal swing to the corner, and we try to eliminate that. 
Um, we try to eliminate as many things as possible that's going to hurt us and many common actions. You know, I think as you come up coaching, you know, you kind of know the, some of the common common actions that people are going to try to run against a two, three or three, two or one, three, one. So you try to eliminate at least those actions. And then, you know, they do something clever then, you know, Hey, but we're going to, we're going to eliminate the, the basic actions. So you're not going to, you're not going to ball screen us and then swing, swing for a corner three. You know, we're going to try to keep you on one side um, of uh, on that ball screen on the zone, you know, and so you won't have a chance to swing to the other side. If you do, it's going to be a skip pass that we can recover to. That's great. And it's really smart that you said that part about downing and icing in zone, because that's something that I found uh, later in my coaching career was the most effective way to defend because you're raised basically already set up to easily ice ball screens because yeah. there's always that drop player at the rim. So can you talk a little bit more about that in terms of your players adjusting to that? Uh, it's something that we probably start doing maybe a couple of years ago, you know, cause like, uh, I think before we, you know, we were just like fight over the screen, which a lot of coaches say when they, when they get in zone, you know, pressure and things like that. So, um, I mean, we're in the zone, I should say, but, uh, we just say, yeah, you know, we're going to, we're going to, you know, for us blue, the, the ball screen, you know, when it's anytime it's an overload action, anytime it's a ball screen, uh, inside ball screen, as we call it in, you know, inside ball screen, we're going to blue the inside ball screen, um, and keep you on that side. We're not going to just allow you to get over to the other side of the zone to hurt us in a corner, you know, with an overload action or something like that. So um, like, and like you said, uh, it's already kind of set up to, 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 to blue or ice the, 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 and especially in two, three, it's already set up that way. So, um, you know, we take advantage of that and it's been working well for us. That's great. And then some of the specific actions, I mean, mostly when you think about playing in zone, one of the first thing that you have to, or playing a zone, you have to account for is the high post. Can you talk about how you're defending high, low and different things like that within your zone defenses? Is it the same in the two, three, as it is in the three, two in the matchup? Pretty much. Cause in, in three, two, we already matched up, but two, three, um, we call it fan out. So when the ball hits the middle, um, the guy rushes the middle, the middle guy rushes the middle guy. And we say rush, we say, we say rush, so you can't just take it and just turn it to go for a high low. So we want to be so on you that you turn almost right into us. So by the time you turn and look for a high low, we've, took, we've taken it away with a diagonal guy, you know, diving down. So we'll, uh, we'll rush the, um, the middle and then we'll fan out. And then once the ball is kicked out the middle back to the outside, then we're back into our regular two, three or whatever we're, you know, whatever we're trying to do. That's great. And then uh, baseline cutters, baseline runners, screens on the baseline in the zone. What what are you doing there? Are you bumping or are you chasing and pushing out? What are you doing? For uh, baseline runners against um, our three two matchup, because I know a lot of times people try to run you know baseline runners against three two. We just call it shift. We we call it a shift. So we just you know as a baseline runner, everyone shifts. You know, so like down the outside guy will shift to the corner, take away the baseline guy. The guy, the other forward usually on the bottom is shifting over, take away the post, and then the opposite guard is dropping down to take away anybody else that's left there. So it's almost turning into a three-two, um, really. But we're shifting on, on on all that stuff to take away the baseline runner action because we know that you know once again that's an action that, that can hurt you if you let it you know let it happen. Um, as far as uh, I think you said uh, baseline, what did you say another one? We're just screening the baseline or baseline runners. It's essentially the yeah. same thing. Yeah. So yeah, we just we, that's what we do. We, we'll shift. We'll call it yeah. shift. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Good to get these insights, of course. And then you had mentioned before about practicing and drilling it for your players. What what are the what are the ways that you practice this? You find the best practice to be able to develop this within? Is it game based play? Is it some type of breakdown? What are you doing mainly to be able to get your players to understand? Both. I mean, we'll we'll break down a three two. I mean, two three. Uh, you know, we'll we'll we'll, we'll do stuff just with the top guy, the, the two top guys. Then we'll do stuff with just the two the two wings. We'll do stuff with just the middle guy, and then we'll like kind of put it all together. I'm a big uh, believer in like. Um, breakdowns and then kind of build up to the hole. I know some people show the hole and then break it down. I like to break down first and then show the hole. You know, everybody's philosophy is a little different, um, mm -hmm. but that's just my philosophy per se. Even with our man-to-man -man defense, like, um, you know, we've been here for a couple, you know, a couple of weeks during the summer. We haven't even got the five-on-five yet. You know, I'm going to make sure the two-on-two, three-on-three, four-on-four principles are straight before we even get the five-on-five. We might not get the five-on-five until next week or something like that, you know. Um, but, you know, I think I'm just a firm believer in that if, if you could break down the parts, then the hole is going to look even better because even with a team, I think that the better the better you are individually, the better the team is going to be. The better skill you have individually, I think is going to you know if we have a whole bunch of guys out of high individual skill, you know I sh I should be able to put together something to make the team you know good. Oh, that's such a great point, and that's your job, isn't it? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Especially at some of these levels where again you can't just necessarily pick the perfect player for every spot on your roster. You've got to figure it out with what you've got. Yeah, without question. You know, um, I would love to just be able to go. 
to the ESPN top 100 list and just offer all those guys a scholarship and see which one sticks, you know, and stuff like ever just, re just recruit those guys and, Hey, you know, call it a day. But with us, you know, we have to recruit, a, you know, uh, all types of people, you know, from, from freshmen to Juco to transfers, to you know, all types of things. So, um, um, we don't necessarily just have like the pick of the litter, you know, that, that other teams might have, but I do think, like I said, I think we get pretty good players. Um, I think that we, we, we kind of, get the players that we know that are going to fit our system. You know, I don't really like small guards. Um, and so we don't really recruit small guards. I think it adds to our length defensively and, and rebounding wise and things like that. So, and um, you know, it, it helps. So I think we've kind of recruit to the system that we, that we, that we have. Well, in mentioning recruiting, are you, uh, are you highlighting your defensive prowess and then what you guys do on defense as part of the recruiting process? Yeah, definitely. We definitely talk about it. We talk about between the winning and, and that, you know, you know, we say that, I try to guarantee the guys, and, and so far, knock on wood, that I've been, you know, right about. I said, if you come here, you're going to win, and if you come here, you're going to play defense. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> so um, they go together, don't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, we've been fortunate to, to you know, we kind of highlight that, and guys kind of buy into it because I think that, um, you know, I always tell myself and assistants that, you know, we got to get guys that could that could, that can play, that can put the ball in a hole. So, usually, the scoring hopefully is not a big concern that we, hopefully we're gonna have some guys that could do some things you know offensively it's just making sure that we got you know the right length and 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 just people want to believe in culture to 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 win i know culture is kind of like an overused word honestly but um you know i know every time a coach get a new job he says we're gonna change the culture and change it you know it's like sometimes the culture doesn't need to be changed just the you know the coach doesn't need to be changed you know something yeah. you know what I'm so uh, you know i don't try to use that word too too much but um there is a culture that we have and our culture is like you know hard work um kind of scrappy and, you know, we're, and we're going to play defense. Like, if you come and play against us, you know we're going to play defense. Love that. And uh, I'm curious then how this defensive philosophy and the different things you do on defense and that you've evolved to over the years, how that influences what you do on offense. Is there any type of connection between the two about your philosophy on defense and then how it influences what you do on offense? We try to, we, like, you know, as, you know, people have shell drill and all types of drills that you might do in a half court, things like that. One thing that we try to do is try to, uh, any turnover, you know, no matter what the drill is, even if we're not doing full court drill, any turnover, you're going, you're going with the with the ball to try to get us a quick score. So with that, you know, we 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 feel like us turning over from defense to off to quick transition to offense has been pretty good. So therefore, the only way to turn that over is to by playing defense, either getting a steal, a stop, you know, a rebound, so we can, you know to to get it get it out and 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 gone, you know, in transition. So we try to use our defense for offense, but we you know we have a lot of different sets and things like that. Um, I, lo I love sets, you know, honestly, I'm trying to get more into this new wave of continuity basketball and, you know, freelance and flow, you know, all types of stuff like that. So I'm trying to, you know, get into that stuff. Um, but I just like kind of, man, I just like, you know, if I, if I, if I see that you're hot, Chris, I want to give you the ball. So I'm going to run a set to give you the ball instead of, you know, hoping that the ball comes to you. But, um, you know, I know that the players like, you know, open stuff. So I'm trying <laughs> I try to get with this open stuff, you know, and figure out what's going on. Well, you can still run a set and run a set into open stuff, obviously. Sure. And that's what most coaches kind of make that uh, connection yeah. between those two. Then the players feel like they're playing open. Yeah, yeah without question. Without question. <laughs> but uh, you mentioned the turnover. I think that's such an important point. And I want to highlight that, that you said that you play on turnovers. And I think too many coaches stop play on turnovers in practice. Whereas that transition from offense to defense or defense to offense, vice versa is so important to work on and uh, not stopping it and worrying about the offensive turnover, but allowing your team to be, or to be able to play in, in uh, conversion. And like, you know, for us, I, I tell the team all the time, you know, coaching division one and college basketball period, it, it's hard to get live ball turnovers. You know, like people are just not giving you the ball. So if you did enough to get a live ball turnover, then let's go down and let's score it. You know, like let's, and one of my biggest pet peeves with my team is don't get a turnover and turn it over back over, you know? So like, that's why we have to have a, you know, a disciplined attack and transition, you know, we not, cause it makes no sense. It negates each other. You work so hard to get a live ball turnover that you try to do something too quick with no plan of attack and turn it back over. And it, you just look, you just look silly out there, honestly, <laughs> you know? So um, we try to practice over and over about getting a turnover trend and changing it to a, um, you know, a score. Well, you mentioned it. I mean, the other part about college is it's really hard to score, isn't it? So yeah. if you've got to convert those turnovers because, again, you know how many games you've been in that have been like low scoring, close games, and those turnovers make a big difference. Without question. I mean, you know, we average 74 points a game, but it's just, I mean, you know, obviously in the tournament, I think we, the score is 54, 53, something like that. So, you know, you're going to have games like that. You're going to have games to score 100. You're going to have games you got to grind it out. 
And, um, you know, you have to just be able to play, you know, a couple different ways. You know, if, if you know, a lot of times a running gun, you know, I know it's not really that popular anymore, but some teams try to do it. And I just don't think that you can do that all the time because, you know, you're going to get yourself in trouble, I, I, I believe. So you got to be able to play, you know, a good pace. You know, I don't want to play in the 60s. You know, I'm not like that. I want to play in the 70s, you know, and hopefully maybe get to the 80s. But if, if we can play in the 70s, I'm, I'm fine with it. And um, just understand that, you know, every game is going to be different when it comes to offense. I love to ask coaches like yourself who have run sets and I've run sets and just talk a little bit about play calling systems. And uh, have you found some best practices for being able to call plays, especially with running obviously multiple sets and specifically running specific sets for specific games? Uh, yeah, I try to, you know, um, have like different packages that we might see um, before the game. Um, I have one, one of my coaches kind of like likes offense a lot. So I, I let him, you know, kind of look at the other team's defense and see what, what he thinks that we should, you know, be able to should run. And then we kind of talk about it and, you know, have a meeting about it. Cause you know, sometimes we have a, we, sometimes we're on the same page most of the time, but we might have a different opinion about a few different plays. And then, uh, you know, we have those set plays, but also at the same time, um, I do keep a, a play card of all my plays with me at all times, because now, you know, in the course of a game, anything can happen, you know, sometimes the scout goes out the window, you know, and, and now you got to do what you got to do. So, um, uh, you know, we try to have packages, but we also, you know, are, are very open to running anything within the, within the game, uh, you know, as well. No, it's great. It's, it's, it's great to be able to get these insights in terms of how everything comes together for you and your program, what's led to the success. And I think the other really neat thing is that you've spent obviously a lot of time at Norfolk state as an assistant and as a head coach. So what you've already referenced in this podcast, and I want to get more insights on is some of the other influences on you, because sometimes it's hard when you're at one place that you've only had this one influence and you've obviously gone way beyond that to be able to improve your coaching and improve your program. Can you talk about some of the other influences? Oh, Tim Cluse. I know he's the coach, you know, coach at Iona for a while. I used to work for Tim Cluse in high school. Um, and I learned, um, I, I was his, uh, his freshman head coach and when he was the varsity head coach. And then when he left uh, St. Mary's to go to, uh, he went to a Juco first as a head coach before, you know, going to CW Post and then Iona. Um, I took over as the varsity um, head coach of that program. And, um, the thing from him that I learned is just about the discipline aspect of it. You know, at that time I was like a 25 year old coach. Um, and I just watched him, you know, he had Danny green and those guys and things like that. And, um, you know, he would, he would not let anybody, you know, no matter if you're Danny green, McDonald's all American, you know, obviously 10, 12 year NBA player, whatever he's up to now, he, or if you was the, the guy on the bottom of the bench, like everybody had to do things the same way, you know, like, so I, I kind of really took that from him um, about just, keeping everybody accountable. Don't just let your star, you know, get away with things because I think it kind of, it, it could, it could backfire with the chemistry of the team. You know, if, if the 13, 14th man, even 10th man, honestly, and, and 10th man, you know, sometimes plays a lot, um, see that the, the star is getting away with whatever, then he's going to feel a certain type of way. It's going to lead to some kind of dissension within the team. But if everybody's been held accountable, um, I think the chemistry and, uh, you know, and, and the respect is there as a whole. So, you know, he really kind of taught me that. And honestly, Tim was the first one to kind of show me um, a matchup zone too. You know, I, I use some of his principles, um, but I, you know, I've developed some of my own uh, as well to kind of get my own style. But um, he was the first one to see that I saw that really, well, maybe not the first one I saw, but the first one I was around on a daily basis that used uh, a matchup zone. So, um, he helped, uh, he helped tremendously on, uh, you know, on that. And then I still talk to Tim all the, you know, all the time. And, you know, I mean, I try to look at, like I said, successful coaches and he was one of the best. I mean, if you look at his record on high school, college, Juco, I mean, he won everywhere, everywhere there was to win, he, he won. So it was like, you know, it was just, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to talk to him as much as I can. And um, for me, you know, being in one spot, like you said, um, you know, one, I know a lot of times, this is my, going to my 15th year coming up. Um, some people say, how, you know, how did you last 15 years in division one basketball? Cause sometimes you, you know, you know how it is, man, people go five years, two years and, you know, and they're gone, but the last 15, um, you know, I guess we're doing something right here at Norfolk state. And, um, you know, I guess the people, you know, here, you know, believe that we're doing something that we're doing something right as well. Well, you're definitely doing something right, which as we know at the college level is you, you have to win and you have to compete. But the other part I imagine is obviously you're a great person. People like you. Otherwise, they wouldn't want to keep you there for that long, right? <laughs> yeah, I try to stay, you know, uh, just I try to say like just a regular guy, man, down to earth. Because I think a lot of times, at least especially when I was an assistant coach, I've seen it my, for my own eyes that people get moved up to either moved up to a bigger job, you know, or, or get the move up to head coach. And then all of a sudden they act like they can't talk to you anymore. And I, I try to say I'm the same person that I was when I was coaching high school, when I 
when I just lived in New York, you know, I'm the same person. And I try not to let any any of this stuff, you know, any success or anything like that or any attention um, get to me or get to my head or anything like that. Like, you know, people, I mean, I've had the same friend for 20 years, you know, 25 years, some 30 years, you know, stuff like that. And and I think anybody who, who meets me is, you know, say, oh, you know, he's a he's a down to earth guy. At least, at least that's what I want them to walk away walk away with, you know, I don't try to get too full of anything, you know, I understand that this is a job and sometimes it's a high profile job, you know, in the situation that you're in, but at the same time, it's, it's a job, you know, like, you know, you shouldn't, you know, I'm not better than anybody else, you know, from a human standpoint, <laughs> you know, and I think that some people, you know, these coaches, sometimes coaches from a human standpoint, when they become the big head coach, they look at, they look down upon people and, I, and I'll never do that. That's just not my, my makeup and not the way I was brought up or anything like that. Well, we can tell just by the way you handle this podcast, Coach. It, it sounds like, again, we're having a real conversation, which is a lot of fun. So it's great. Um, I, in preparing for the podcast, I was also saw a note on you talking about transitioning from press break into your offense with no pauses or no stoppage in that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that's an under-talked about area, of, especially when we're talking about college or high school basketball, when you're playing against a lot more pressing teams. Yeah, we practice that. We practice that. We drill that, too. We, we, you know, we have a couple of different press breaks, obviously, as you can imagine, but um, we'll, we'll practice those press breaks into a set, you know, right away. So, you know, because, I mean, let's face it, you know, you know, as much as you want to break a press for a layup, you're probably not going to break a press for a layup. Now, the, the biggest thing is just not turn the ball over. You know, if you not turn the ball over, get the ball over half court, you know, now, okay, now what? You know, so we, we practice that. We practice press breaks into, into a half court set. And we'll do that, you know, we'll have one group go, you know, four times up and down, back, back, and then we'll have another group go. So it's a, a constant flow of uh, practicing press break into a, into a set. So it's no, like, no stoppage, no break, no, you know, any of that stuff. So when it does happen to us in a game, it's just now just muscle memory. It's amazing. I mean, it seems so simple when you say it, but I know a lot of coaches don't devote enough time to it. So I'm curious then with you, are there specific sets or actions that you found that are easier to flow into out of, say, this chaotic mess that you get past the press and now you got to figure out how to get organized? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I think a lot of times, like, you know, if we have a good secondary, um, you know, we try some, some of our press breaks are kind of already kind of set up into our secondary offense. So that's the easiest, but um, we'll practice just, you know, any set, you know, into the, from the press break to the office. And also I think it promotes our guys. What we're trying to do is trying to get them to get into the sets quicker, you know, just in general, because a lot of times, you know, you'll see it, it you know, somebody will point guard call a set. It might take the guys, if someone's moving slow or walking, three seconds to get into a four seconds to get, even get into the set, you know, which is, you know, ridiculous to me. So, you know, if we call a set, we were practicing about getting into that set quick. Let's, let's execute it. And let's, you know, let's go from there. The, the other note that I had from preparing for this is you, you mentioned something about uh, different ways that you teach and then that you highlight three ways for players to uh, play off the pick and pop. Can you talk a little bit about that technique? I assume you guys run a lot of ball screen and then this is evolved from that. Yeah, um, yeah, we do run a lot of balls. <laughs> not, not like, uh, not a, not, not like how Billy Donovan used to run. You know, uh, all these ball screens, but we do have a lot of ball <laughs> screen action. Um, we kind of have like a ball screen package uh, a, a little bit um, because for us, once again, about trying to play on the opponent's weakness. If, if a team is a really good ball screen defensive team, you know, then we have another package that we can almost stay away from ball screens. We just use down screens and and flare screens and things like that. But for us, for the pick and pop, I mean, we, you know, we try to throw, um, you know, we use the pocket pass, um, you know, we'll use a, a hook pass or we'll use a reverse pivot pass because I'm, I'm, I'm big on not turning over the ball. You know, um, you know, if you look at my teams, we don't turn over the ball that much. You know, and if we do turn it over, it's like a just a really bad game, you know, something. But, uh, you know, we really try not to turn over the ball that much. We preach not turn over the ball because I really think that turn over the ball and I know it happens, you know, so I probably probably a little out of this world with my thinking, but I just think that like, you shouldn't turn over the ball. I mean, you think that you're at a level that you shouldn't turn over the basketball. You know, if the guy is open, don't pass it to him. You know, if it, the, you know, if it, you know, your footwork. We work on footwork all the time too. But I think that travels. I call them. I tell my guys all the time that travels are, are, are silly. You know, and, and and so we work on footwork all the time and things like that to try to eliminate even those turnovers. Because you watch a game, especially a college game, maybe not the pros, but because I know in pros they don't call it call travel. <laughs> but it, and again, college. You know, you'll see three travels a game with someone, and it's like, why are you guys traveling? <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, so um, we'll do things like that. But yeah, those are three things I'm talking about with pick and pop, though. 
So the, the importance of the pass, the importance of the footwork. And then I imagine the third part is the importance of the decision uh, to, to throw it or not. So can you talk about that a little bit, how you're teaching decision-making within those situations? I tell them that usually coming off a pick and roll, usually you know should have two two to three dribbles at, at most to make a decision. I mean, you should be able to see right away if you're going to be able to get to the gap to score. You should see if someone's open or you should see if you're going to get to the gap if someone's open on the weak side, you know, within two or three dribbles. If you're dribbling more than that, you're probably just pounding the ball and just trying to just, you know, get your own ISO basketball type situation going on. And um, although I'm from New York City, and I know, uh, you know, you grew up in the playgrounds, and things like that. I'm not a huge fan of ISO uh, basketball. I think that you can isolate someone to, to be able to go by someone or something like that. But I don't, I'm not a huge fan of just getting the ball and, you know, cross, cross, cross and try to, you know, make something happen. I think you do that, you do that in the park, uh, you know, of New York City, you know, you don't do that on the collegiate playground. Yeah, it's a, a good distinction there, Coach. Thanks for sharing that. Is the difference between obviously putting a player in space and advantage versus obviously them creating the space and advantage on their own. Yep. What a question, Coach. Uh, just so many insights. And now this is a new challenge for you in a sense. And I know there's more to do once you get to the tournament. But now you've got players that have experienced this success. Is that easier now or harder to be able to get them to focus and motivate to that next level? Uh, I think it's still too, a little to be determined because um, right now our summer workouts are great. I think everyone's focused. You know, I think what we did was uh, we save, you know, because, you know, for us, we you know, you get rings and stuff like that. So we have a ring ceremony later on the season. But, you know, NCAA gives you the watches, you know. So what we did was like the, the very first day they came back, we gave the returners their watches to almost kind of like put that, that spark back in them, you know, about the NCAA tournament. So I think that right now everyone's kind of focused on the NCAA tournament. And then some of the guys here, too, uh, you know, I went. I went with. I was assistant coach when we went in 2012. So that was like an incredible experience being Missouri. I mean, the place 20,000 people. You know, all, all the great stuff. The guys who went last year had a great time, but they didn't really fully experience the whole NCAA tournament. You know, I mean, with limited fans and um, you know not being able to leave the hotel and things like that. Um, so I think they want to get back to really fully experience the whole NCAA tournament. You know, because once you drink from that cup, you know, you want to keep drinking from that that same cup. You know, it's like once you you know you. If you eat bologna sandwiches growing up, by the time you have some steak, you never want to have bologna ever again. You know, <laughs> so it's like, you know, you want to get back to the NCAA tournament. And I think that is, um, it's easier to sell it to everybody because one, we've done it. Um, a lot of guys are here back that have done it. And um, they can easily tell the new guys about the right way to to do it. And, um, and like I said, you know, I think getting over that hump and um, it's going to pay dividends in the, in the, in the long run. Because now you have guys with really true championship uh pedigree you know on 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 this on this team so uh i mean i look forward to the challenge um, i think you know even with the win percentage in conference we always going to have a bullseye on our back um, in conference play whether we won the tournament championship or not because we won a few regular season championships so people know that we're going to be one of the better teams in the conference but now stepping out into that non-conference world as an ncaa tournament participant um you know no one's taking you for granted in that non-conference either you know if anything people are gunning for you too especially if they didn't make the tournament themselves you know because so it's going to be a challenge the whole season and and hopefully um our principles and our our belief and and our team and our structure and our culture can, can help uh, get us back to the NCAA tournament we love it and uh, we can tell from listening to you that you are, are both hungry and passionate about what you do and how you do it and that's just wonderful so thank you so much coach for sharing the game with us all right thank you thank you for having me appreciate you